Welcome to this episode of the Customer Centric Retailing Podcast, a forum for retail leaders to discuss industry trends, challenges, and opportunities. This is Anil. And this is Fabi. And each episode, we invite some of the brightest minds in the industry to discuss the future of customer centricity, with topics ranging from the rise of e commerce to brick and mortar operations to omni channel technology to retail culture and how all of these elements come together to create customer centric retailing. Today, we have with us Chris Walton former Vice President of Target's Store of the Future project, senior contributor to Forbes, and now the founder and co-CEO of OmniTalk. Chris has over 20 years of experience in omnichannel retailing and is well-versed in virtually every discipline within retail, including store operations, e-commerce, and inventory management. Welcome to the podcast, Chris. It's a pleasure having you on, and we're excited to ask you a whole bunch of questions. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Great to have you. Uh, before we jump in, can you just give our audience a just a brief intro to yourself and, and what attracted you to this industry? Oh man, um, yeah, what a, God, <laughs> great question. What attracted me to this industry? I, I actually got into retail kind of as a lark, honestly. I was come, I was graduated from college back in 1999, I think, or what? Yeah, it was, and uh, I didn't, I didn't, I was like most college students didn't know what to do with myself, and uh, ended up meeting a few people at the Gap. Really liked the co- corporate culture and the brand at that time. You know, Gap was kind of the big thing back then, and so. I ended up signing on with them. And next thing I knew, I kind of just fell in love with retail. I loved like I loved being able to walk into a store and being able to tell my fam- friends and family, like, look, I helped make this like Barracuda jacket come alive in the Gap store, you know, in the late 90s. And, and that was fun. And, um, you know, and then for me, I ended up going to business school and, uh, and, and kind of missed retail while I was at business school. So I decided to get back into it. And so, yeah, professionally, I spent a lot of number of years at the Gap. Um, and then after business school, I spent about 12 years at Target. Um, and at Target and across Target and Gap, I've done almost every job in retail under the sun. I mean, the only things I really haven't done are maybe hardcore engineering because I'm not an engineer by trade and um, I haven't spent too much time in marketing either. But everything else I've pretty much done. I was a core merchandiser for Target for a number of years for stores. Um, I actually went out into the field in my mid 30s out in Colorado and learned how to run Target stores. Uh, and then from there, I. Uh, I was uh, named the vice president of home furnishings for Target.com, right? When Target came off the Amazon platform, which was a great experience and uh, finished out my career there heading up Target Store of the Future Project, which was, Chris, five to 10 years out, why are people coming to physical stores to shop and how would you conceive of the Target brand and answering that question? So my, my current business partner and I, Ann Mazinga, spent, gosh, two, year, two plus years figuring out what the answer to that question was, designing a full omni-channel store, physical store concept for scale. Uh, and, uh, and it was the, one of the best jobs we've ever had. And, uh, now what we do is use that, uh, experience and the lessons we learned and, and we write and talk about the future of retail and try to be retailers ourselves, uh, running our blog OmniTalk as well as our, our new e-commerce venture, uh, urban rooster shop. Yeah, that's great. I think a lot of the people that we speak to when we ask them how they, got into this industry they tell us it was really accidental and maybe they got a job at the gap uh, high school job yeah (laughs) and and now they've had a 30 30 year career and they've done great things and that's certainly the case with you it sounds like um and it's great that you have so much experience across a couple of, of different disciplines within the industry and there's so much that we can talk to you about within the industry it's, it's really hard to kind of narrow it down. Um, mm-hmm. But I wanted to start off just asking you about one of the recent articles that you wrote in Forbes called The Five Stages of Omnichannel Retailing. And you wrote that the term omnichannel is back on vogue and it only took a global pandemic to do it. Uh, and that's certainly true. The buzzword is really everywhere right now. But there's a lot of disagreement about what it actually means in the industry. Um, and there's a lot of retailers out there that are calling themselves omnichannel, and then we on this podcast don't believe that they truly are. And I know that you share that belief. So I know that you've written that you don't think initiatives like buy online, pick up them in store by themselves uh, do the term justice. So I'm just curious, in your view, what does omnichannel mean? Um, and do you have some examples maybe of retailers that are really doing it right? Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Lots to unpack there. I mean, I think, you know, first and foremost, and we can talk, I'm curious, you know, what, what you guys think too, as, 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 as we go here, but like, you know, from my perspective, I think Omnichannel is, first of all, let's talk about the word. I think Omnichannel is really funny. Like I probably first heard about it. 
I don't know, like 2000, Neil, what you, 2013, 2014, you know, it started coming, you know, to, to, to the forefront. And then, you know, people were like, ah, it's a weird word. You got Omni Omni on the front of it. And I've literally been at dinners. I can remember dinners in 2017 with other retail pundits where they were like, it's a terrible word. We should never use it. And like, everyone's saying this now. And I was like, really, everyone's saying it or just you and your circles are, cause I don't really understand it. Like, it seems like you guys are all describing the same thing. Um, and my point has been this, is that, you know, Omnichannel really never should have gone away. It's as good of a word as anything else. We need a word because it is a different way to do retail. I think that's, that's the argument I don't like the most is when I hear people say it's just retail and it's like, well, it's not just like e-commerce wasn't retail. It's a different way of doing retail. And you have to think about that. Sure. Fundamentally, it all ladders into retail, but we need something to describe it. And I think the cool thing about the pandemic is it has at least brought the conversation back and that's what matters most, because to me, it's all sem- semantics, whether you want to call it omnichannel, whether you want to call it new retail, some people call it harmonized retail. I've heard that a few different ways to Sunday. It's all the same damn thing, which is essentially that the consumer is at the center of consumption. It's a choose your own adventure style of retailing when they can decide how they want to buy something whenever they want to buy it. And what that means for retailers is they have to fundamentally put the foundational systems in place to make that happen. And the way it happens is that it's all predicated upon understanding data in real time across every touch point that you have with your consumer. Right now, that concept is still nirvana for almost everyone. Overseas in China, they're much further along. Like Alibaba is pretty damn close to being able to understand what everyone's doing all the time when they're interacting with their brand, wherever in the world that person, he or she might be. Over here in the U.S., it's different, but that's you know that's fundamentally what we're talking about. And there's different things that bring that along. That's why I don't. I think all this curbside pickup stuff, it's great, but just because you're doing that doesn't make you an omni-channel retailer. It's the interconnectedness of that activity with the other things that you're doing as a retailer that matter most. Yeah, in fact, you know, uh, Chris, like you said, it's important here is that. Um, uh, the retailers in, in U.S. have a lot of legacy. Organized retail in U.S. started way early before any, uh, you know, on the particularly in China or east side of the globe. So there's a lot of legacy and uh, we have so much here already that needs to be, you know, either debated or has to be, you know, proven wrong. It's not relevant for today. So then comes in like it's much harder work because now you have to discuss with the executives who have the power. They created all that stuff, right? They created all those old processes. But uh, now you are saying, hey, those things doesn't work for today. What you need to do today is very different. So is it because like, you know, people are having hard time accepting the change? Is it something like, you know, a generation problem? Uh, for example, like, you know, even in the families, like if my son is doing something, it takes me a while to accept it, right? Because I did it differently <laughs> versus what my son is doing. So, but then it mm-hmm. takes time and finally I, ha- I I accept it, right? So similarly, I believe the new generation of retailing uh, is something that the previous generation has to, you know, really uh, take some time to really understand with the with the mindset of being more in acceptance mode, and then agree to to you know throw it out the door, start uh, go back to the drawing board, bring their customer in the center, mm-hmm. and then address to their customer's need instead of like hey this is how I want to serve you no this is how my customer wants me to be served so let me address to their needs right yep. Exactly. No, I think exactly. I think what you're saying is exactly right. I think I think a couple of things. One, you're 100 percent right. I mean, I think when you look at overseas, what's happening in China, they started from a different foundation. It was a, a different just a different infrastructural platform on top of which to do retail. U.S., it's different. You had, you know, legacy store operations. Then if you stop and think about it, e-commerce is actually, you know, 20 years old now at this point too, 20 plus years old at this point. And so what you're hitting at is is a scientific fact. It's called neuroplasticity, which is the idea that the older we are and the more accustomed we are to doing things a certain way, the harder it is for us to learn something new. And and that's the beauty of the pandemic is that it's actually forcing everyone into this state of our minds actually now have to adjust to what maybe none of us really understood on both the e-com and the legacy bricks and mortar side to create something that actually works 
and is defined by what we all want. Uh, and that's what's I think that's what's really exciting and inspiring about the time that we live in. But that has been the phenomenon is that you have, you know, for the most part, I hate to say it, but, you know, 50 to 60 plus year old white males leading legacy companies who learned retail a certain way. So it's hard for them to do it differently. And even the e-commerce guys, as they try to go into physical retail, they know their side. You know, they know that very kind of left brained analytical way to do online commerce. But then you start going in the physical world and it falls flat and there's all the things you have to think about. Now you add the omnichannel perspective into it too. And what type of retail you're doing, mall based, non-mall based, like it starts to get complicated. And so those guys are having to learn new muscle memory as well. Yeah, something we talk about on this podcast a lot is kind of the resistance to innovation that we're seeing in the retail world right now and how the term omnichannel is misused because uh, brick and mortar retailers that also have an e-commerce storefront that doesn't communicate in any way to their brick and mortar stores call themselves on the channel just because they have both. Right. Um, so I wanted to go back to your article just for a second, because I do think you you hit the nail on the head there with the five stages that you talk about in the article. Sure. So if you could just walk our audience through what those five stages are and where you see retailers getting stuck the most often. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, as I was writing that article, uh, someone had asked me, they said, you know, Chris, would you would you just write this for me as a consultant that lives out in California? And I said, yeah, I'll, I'll do this for you and, and, and see where it goes. And so I, I, I in the process of, in the creative process, yeah, came up with what I call the, the five stages of omnichannel retailing. And I think you touched on it a little bit too, but the first stage is what I call the solo operation. So, you know, that's what's been, that's it's been around since the dawn of time, right? Since there was still, since there was first, you know, a, a, a vendor stand at some, uh, you know, temple back in the day. But, you know, that's basically like you have a bricks and mortar store, you have an e-commerce site, uh, and that's what you do. That's how you make money. And that could be a really big operation. It could be a small mom and pop business. It doesn't matter. Uh, the second stage is what I call multi-channel retailing. And I think, you know, that is what you specifically alluded to. And that is really where you might have, you know, an e-commerce site, you might have a store stood up, but they're not really coordinated with each other and they're not talking to each other. And I can tell you before, before, um, Target brought in a lot of new digital talent back in around in and around 2013. That's how Target ran. You know, the website pretty much didn't talk to the bricks and mortar side. The assortments weren't coordinated. You, you've seen that a lot through retail's history. And so, yeah, you can say you have those things, but that doesn't make you omnichannel. The third stage is what I would call uh, a coordinated retailing. And so that is where you start to see some different activities where you, you are using those two things in concert. That's where as much as much as I was saying, buy online, pick up in store doesn't make you omnichannel. It is it is a necessary condition, though, probably for you know moving in that direction. So you're using your website as a way to communicate different options for fulfillment. You know that is coordinated with your store, what's happening online, what's happening via your mobile app. It's probably taking actions via social media, maybe doing things to quicken the pace of commerce. You know, inside of Instagram, inside of Facebook things of that nature. So it's the beginning coordination of those types of activities. And that's, I think, where you see kind of the best of the best retailers at this point. Like my legacy, I would say that's probably where Target is right now. Um, I think that's where Best Buy is right now. Um, everyone's trying to move beyond that, uh, but but they're still qu- not quite into that next stage. And the next stage is really what I refer to as, it's kind of this, this world where Physical retail is almost like a, it almost works like a mouse on a browser. And so what does that mean? So like in e-commerce, the beauty of it is we as e-commerce retailers can know everything you click, every page you browse, everything you do. And we can analyze all of that data as, as a funnel of purchasing, right? So we can know what, what choices we make matter to consumers or not within the consumption funnel. Physical retail, we don't have that ability, right? We don't understand where people are in space, where products are in space, how all the coordinated decisions we make as as employees in the store or what products we put in there, what merchandising we do. None of that can be understood and optimized to the same degree as e-commerce. That is really the fourth stage of omnichannel retailing is being able to do that. The only retailer in the U.S. as of right now that can do that at any scale is really Amazon for the most part. And it's Amazon is doing it by way of computer vision in Amazon Go. They know everything that's happening in that store, where every product's moving, 
where every person is, what they're buying, why they're buying it, how it coordinates back to the website, yada, yada, yada. There's a lot of people experimenting with it. There's different ways you can do that, different analogs to it. You could use scan and go technology. Um, you have different check out free experiments similar to Amazon Go that are running. But for the most part, no one has really cracked the code on that yet. Alibaba has done it overseas, but Amazon's really the only one here in my mind. The last piece is really where it gets supercharged. And that's where you start talking about an end to end consumer understanding. So it's one thing to have the understanding of who the consumer is in the digital world, like I talked about, and in the physical world, like a mouse on a browser. But to have that understanding the entire time, almost across an entire horizontal line, that's nirvana. And everyone is still trying to reach that. So what do I mean by that? Well, that's having an understanding of this concept of kind of the end-to-end -end line of social commerce. Where on one end of that line, you have commerce happening, a marketplace could be a store, digital front, whatever. But the best way to think about that, I think Amazon's marketplace. The other end of that line, you have a social media network. Think Facebook, Instagram. It's the connection of everything that happens along that spectrum that is so powerful. And why do I say that? Well, because if you can connect those two things end to end, you know everything your consumer is doing, right? Think about a social network. They know everything you like, everything you comment on, probably how long you take to scroll past certain pictures of people from high school relative to others. They know more about us than we probably know about ourselves. And it's the ability to use that information about us contextually, based on where we are in the world, where we are psychologically, that allows retailers, if they have the commerce on the other side of it, to serve us up what we want in the moment and the action, and so we can decide what we want to buy, but the action of getting that product to our homes becomes, or wherever we want, almost becomes like a second thought that we don't have to consider. It becomes whatever we need that's most convenient to us, convenient to us. And that's where things are moving. So we can talk more about that, but that's just the general, and I was a little bit long, so sorry for that, everyone. But like, that is really how the five stages play out. No one in the US is there. That is why though, Amazon is so hell bent on Alexa in our homes. And also why Walmart has been going after TikTok to the degree that they have. They want to create, they want that hook on the social side of that consumer understanding. Why do you think it is, as you say, that no one in, in the U.S. has been able to achieve that? Is it is it just going to take time? Is it a technological void? What What is the holdup? Yeah, I think it's both. I think, number one, it's 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 really hard to create a social network, you know, doing what, say, a Facebook has done. I mean, that's where you look at the to me, the next 10 years are going to be Facebook versus Amazon. You got a two billion dollar plus social network on one side and then you've got, you know, Amazon and its powerful marketplace on the other. And then now you've got Walmart potentially with the TikTok entrance, which is really fascinating too, depending on where TikTok ends up going. It's just, that's not easy to simulate. That's hard to do. And so I, in some ways, I, in this idea, I'd give Facebook a big leg up. Now, Amazon's been really smart because they're using Alexa as an end and around on that, right? How can you understand consumers in the same manner, but not through a social feed, right? They're understanding it on our countertop. So, you know, they understand our conversations. They understand when we're happy, when we're sad, when we're fighting with the spouse, when we're happy with the kids. Knowing all of that can then be correlated against all their different activities and consumptive media that they put out in the market, whether it's Amazon Prime, whether it's any of the digital platforms of theirs that we engage with. All of that can be used in the same manner. So it's really a race to see which of those kind of concepts ultimately wins in the end. Is it going to be inherent in the social platform or is it going to be inherent in something like Amazon's doing with the end around on voice? Um, the different part, too, is what we're still talking about is that you also have to probably likely be in physical stores because physical stores are in still some way are still some way of convenience for many people. And the pandemic showing that depending on what they need to accomplish. And so Amazon in this last year has opened up some 40 stores to that end to help with the coordination of all these activities. So like, you know, uh, uh, Chris, like uh, what you said is pretty high end technology, actually mm -hmm. not many retailers will have access to it. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Walmart can get it somehow, uh, Amazon has it and maybe a few more would get it. But like we have like millions of retailers yeah. out there, right? And new coming up. So how are they going to, uh, you know, survive or work through this whole 
uh, retailing scenario? Yeah, I, that's an awesome question. And I've been hearing that consistently in my work, in my research too, is that for the people trying to get to that fourth and fifth stage of omni-channel retailing, it's, it's really to the, uh, the what's the phrase I'm looking for? The, 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 the spoils go to the rich, so to speak, or whatever it is. To the rich go the spoils. That's what I'm trying to say here on, a, on the early morning. Uh, that's what's been happening. And, and the reason for that is technologically, fundamentally, what you're talking about is cloud commerce. You're talking about a real-time foundational data understanding of people by way of what's happening with your order management systems and your point of sale systems and the coordinated activity of those two things, the transaction logs and the inventory logs. And the big guys, because of who they are, have had the money to invest and upgrade their systems in that direction. The little guys, and we're talking, you know, everyone, anyone from one billion up to the biggest guys possible, then you have the small, medium-sized businesses, especially the people in that one billion to Fortune 50, that's a huge void in terms of how and where that activity is going to need to take place or how that improvement in technology is going to need to happen. And so that's why I think you're seeing so much activity uh, in order management systems, in point of sale systems here, you know, especially brought on by the pandemic. So, so you think that you know there is going to be uh, um, you will you will come up with your new uh, framework like uh, five steps to uh, you know true omnichannel or serving your customer in the best way. Do you think we 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 should wait for your another blog which has those five steps for you know these uh, this mid sized retailers or even the smaller than that? Yeah, the five the five tactical steps you can do now. I haven't thought about that. I should maybe that should maybe that should be the follow on piece. I like that. Yeah. I like that. I like that a lot. Yeah, because and, uh, and who the tech companies can be too. <laughs> yeah, because like you know what you said is like a two interesting point. Now it's because uh, I have my interest in those two technologies, so I'm going to pick up on those. Mm -hmm. It's like a distributed order management point of sale system and a good e-com connected into these uh, these system will bring in a good infrastructure. This is a good infrastructure as long as all of this is happening on the cloud, right? And yeah. with these three different technologies working together in, in sync, in harmony, uh, using the cloud connected in real time, I believe uh, we can achieve a reasonable level of customer-centric retailing, right? For at the, at the reasonable technology cost, right? Yeah, 100% agree. Yeah, and the important thing there is what you said in terms of like what the consumer expects. I think the hard part about the, the hard part about the technology conversation when you act about like what has what is what's taken so long you know in reality it's you know it's probably happening pretty quickly you always think innovation slower than, than 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 it probably actually is but you know the especially on the order management side of things it's always been you know for the most part it's always been more of a cost control conversation right how do we get goods from point a to point b what the pandemic has shown and i think the smart companies are realizing this is that when you need items, how quickly you need them, how much you're willing to pay for them uh, as a result of when you need them is a really important criteria in the purchase funnel. So that, you know, as people are shopping, that has to be understood. And so that requires, you know, cloud-based systems that are flexible, adaptive to serve up those needs. And then it also requires great front-end experience design for whatever those digital interfaces might be to let consumers know when and where things are available and at what cost. So like, you know, uh, in that case, what uh, the next question that I have is that in the last six months, right, since this whole pandemic came to yeah. peak in, in, since April, uh, many retailers have started, uh, you know, make, made available uh, curbside pickup and bopies and all that, right? Very quickly, like six weeks, they rolled out Bopis or curbside pickup. And I'm questioning yeah. like, well, uh, you, how did you do it? So, and this is something, you know, comes back from my technology background because I'm from the engineering background. So do you think right now, whatever they have is a prototype, which sort of kind of works, but at least proves the point? And will they go back? Will these retailers go back, revisit it? and figure out how to make it efficient, how to make it better, how can they, you know, reduce the, uh, have them manage the stress, added stress on the on the associates in the store. Like you said, you know, the user experience of the store associates, are they going to go mm -hmm. consider that? So also like, you know, a lot of these retailers have repurposed their existing OMS, which was designed for optimizing the cost. 
they have repurposed that for you know delivering bopis or you know curbside pickup so do you think they will go back to it and and, and look at it like see if they need to upgrade their oms uh, go back to like a real cloud based system that will provide them exactly what you said you know customers need address to customers need that let's deliver get them the item when they need and where they need so how, what do you, what is your take what is your opinion on like should retailers go back how many of them will really consider reviewing or you know revisiting their implementations of bopis and uh curbside pickup and what would be your idea and our suggestions on how they should approach it yeah absolutely i think i think yeah i mean i think this 100 percent. the smart ones the smart ones most definitely will um i i i had the i had the fortunate opportunity to interview for example the chief product officer at sam's club and and, and i asked him point blank you know what are the keys that have enabled you to move so quickly and they've been i would say they, they're one they've been working on this for a while and doing it well you know, and he said what we've been talking about, which is having your cloud point of sale system and thinking about order management to the same degree. Um, the important point here is that this stuff's not going away. I mean, what the pandemic has shown is that curbside pickup, buy online, pickup in store, they're important for consumers for two reasons. One, people don't necessarily want to pay the shipping fees. And two, it gives them access to products same day on their schedules, too, more so than, say, waiting for a delivery. So that's not going anywhere. And I think, Anil, to your point, you're seeing a lot of people muscle that right now just to get it done, which is 100% fine. And quite frankly, I mean, you know, from engineering, that's how most of your first MVP products roll out, right? It's like, let's just get it out there, test it and see what happens. Um, but the smart ones will the smart ones will have to continue to invest to make that better because consumers are going to continue to see it as an expectation that all retails have in their offering. And so like I talked about before, you're going to have to design your front end to showcase that in a different way than you probably have. You're going to need to continue to refine it. But the other important thing is the economics of it still probably have to improve. Right now, there's so, so many changes in how the pandemic is having a shop or what we're spending our money on, whether it's an increase in groceries because we're not going to, to eat out or home furnishings or whatever it is. It's hard to really understand the true economic impact of all this. But net net, if everything returns to normal, you have to think retailers are going to find, have to find more efficient ways to do all of this. And so investing in those systems to make that happen so you can both shape the demand on the front side to maximize revenue, but also lower costs and to develop the systems, depending on who you are as a retailer, that you want to use to meet the customer demand across all the different fulfillment types. You're going to have to invest in those spaces and in the partnerships probably that make, you know, different things happen, whether it's delivery to your home with third party service providers, whether you start putting fulfillment centers in your own stores to pick and pack orders to get more efficiency there. All of which still, no matter what choice you choose, comes back to having a really good order management system that's always working in concert with everything else real time. You mentioned that you were talking uh, with executive at uh, Sam's Club, and then the conversation of having point of sale on the cloud came up. Uh, give me some more information on it. Like, uh, what is how is how are retailers thinking about it? Because that will be a big, a big, big project across all the retailers. I mean, it must be like a trillion dollar economy right there. Like, you know, upgrading their, throwing out their old point of sale, putting in a new point of sale system that is like you know cloud based point of sale system. So you're talking about so much economic activity, maybe like at the scale of Y2K, I don't know, but similar somewhere in that. Yeah, and it's not, I think the other important part of that conversation too is it's not an either or discussion. I try to tell retailers this all the time and I can think GNC just had a great rollout like this, for example, where it's not necessarily about a full replace, like rip out, replace. Yeah, you could do it that way, but hell, there's a ton of risk if you change your point of sale system. And I can see why no CFO or you know anyone, CEO wants to do that. Right. Um, but it doesn't have to be that. It can also be built on like the idea of redundancy. And so the beauty of that conversation I had with the Sam's Club CEO was like, look, across the entire Walmart entity, we've got certain things running. But at the same time, we can put a point of sale doesn't have to be a big legacy NCR system. It can be as simple as a mobile phone in an employee's hand, which is running redundant to the legacy system that you have. And so his point was just. If I break my mind from that construct and I free people up that way, I can have something running side by side 
And therefore, I can do a ton of things off that. Like it can be a scan and go mobile application for consumers. It can be a concierge servicing application for employees as people drive up and they say, hey, can I take your order? What would you like? And they key it into a tablet. They then go pick it and shop it just like they're a scan and go shopper. And it's all ready for them. And they haven't had to rip out or replace anything. It's all additive and works within the flow of the consumer design they're trying to accomplish. And that's the part I don't think people really understand is that there's so many ways to experiment with cloud POS that are pretty low risk and and not that invasive at all, if at all. As you can tell by uh, Anil's passion on this topic, we, we love talking about technology on the on this podcast. And the reason for that being is it's really easy to have a conceptual discussion about omni-channel and say, yeah, we're omni-channel. We like to put our customers first. It's really easy to say that, but there is a technological underpinning to that. Um, and as you said, it doesn't require a rip to replace, but it does require some sort of a shift. And I think a lot of the traditionally brick and mortar retailers are struggling right now to piece together kind of a legacy tech stack with newer technologies to achieve experiences that they want to give to their customers. And direct to consumer brands typically have an advantage over more traditional brick and mortar retailers because they've, they've grown up digital. They've had the opportunity to create that store network from scratch. Uh, while brick and mortar retailers in many cases have to re rebuild at least part of it. Uh, but still very often we see that the direct to consumer brands, they, they make the same mistakes as their brick and mortar counterparts. They just do it in reverse. Uh, so I'm curious if, if you've seen that happen as well and, and what your opinion is on that. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I think there's a, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. I think it goes back to what we talked to. It's like, you know, it goes back to, you know, they, they know e-commerce. And then when they go into physical retail, you're probably sent, you're probably reaching out and saying, okay, who knows physical retail? And those people that you're reaching out to, you probably knew physical retail from before, right? And they have the resumes, the background, the consulting practices, and they're like, hey, come in, we're going to show you how to do this. But in reality, what it takes is that kind of entrepreneurial mindset to go out and create something new. Some There's some great companies that I think are doing that. Like I look at a, like a Fabletics, who I think has a great mindset in that approach. But then you'll see other e-commerce players. But yeah, for sure, they'll come in and they'll just kind of do the same standard garden variety thing. I think the hard part with all of it contextually, though, especially coming off what we just talked about, it's much easier to move technology fast. It's much easier to move software fast. Like, right, physical retail is... is and when you start talking about physical retail and architecture, that's just something that takes a lot longer to do. And so I think there's just going to inherently be a lot more growing pains as you try to figure out the answers to these questions. Like you, and you asked about, you know, where are people going to go next with pickup and store? Sure, they're going to invest in technology, but there's probably going to have to be architectural changes for packing and picking, architectural changes for storage. I'm curious to see as the rest of the holidays play out, like, are there going to have to be changes to the parking lot designs and traffic flow, depending on the size of the retailer? Uh, and then you think about a lot of these e-commerce brands too. You know, a lot of them are, you know, startups in the, what quote unquote used to be the specialty of apparel space, right? The things that typically have gone into malls. Well, what is the omni-channel answer, you know, inside of that construct? I think everyone's trying to grapple with that, right? Does that belong to the mall operator who's coordinating all these activities? Does it belong to the individual purveyor inside of the mall? Both. Those are still really fundamentally difficult questions to answer. I think the smart players are trying to figure out how to go outside of that. Like you see like a Sephora, who I think is one of the best omni-channel retailers, Start to think about the right partnerships, start to think about a more off mall based retail, re, retail real estate strategy. Those are the things that inherently, I think, hold it back to answer your question. There is so much that, that you said there that, that we can un, un, unpack. <laughs> um, but to pivot a little bit, because I want to make sure to touch on this, I think our audience will find it really interesting. Um, another topic that you're really knowledgeable, knowledgeable about um, is social commerce and how retailers can leverage social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram and TikTok uh, to sell their products. And I think very few retailers really know how to take advantage of these platforms. Some do. Um, Sephora, again, does a good job. Um, but actually, a lot of retailers have a subpar social commerce strategy, especially brands that didn't grow up with social media and they're learning on the go. Um, and I'm curious why you think it's important for retailers to adopt these networks as part of their overall omni-channel strategy and does social commerce play into omni-channel? Uh, yeah, I think it 100% does. I mean, it's part of that line. I think to answer that question, let me first set, set kind of the mindset by which I think about that. I think 
I had the chance to hear Eric Nordstrom speak. It was probably at Shop Talk a couple of years ago. And he, he said something I'll never forget, which is he said, we're taking a market-based approach to our strategy. So you talked about, you know, how do you, how do you understand Omnichannel when you see it, so to speak? Uh, what he said there is really important because a market-based strategy versus a uh, channel strategy is really the right way to go. And he was talking about within context of Nordstrom Local, where he is saying, look, our website, our new Nordstrom Local initiative, they're small stores, we're very service oriented, and our department stores are all part of our, are all tools in our toolbox to attack a market. Different markets will use different tools different ways, but ultimately we'll use them all to understand and to validate the movements we're having against the customer file, essentially, which is the same way you think about e-commerce, right? You have X number of customers, how many are returning, what's the general value of each of them. Omnichannel retailing is about understanding your market dynamics in the exact same way, honestly, based on what I've been saying, down to the individual customer level. So social commerce is just another tool within your market approach to talk to customers. And so that's why Facebook and Instagram are so interesting. Now, on top of that, what we talked about before and we have to realize is that Instagram slash Facebook is by default becoming the 21st century mall. It is what people know. I think it was two, three weeks ago, Instagram made a huge announcement. They did another one last week. They, they redesigned their homepage. They hadn't done it for years. And what do they do? They made shopping front and center on their homepage. So now essentially you can follow whatever retailer you want. You almost don't need retailers, uh, mobile apps anymore either. Like you can go into Instagram, follow whatever retailer you want, get inspired by something in the moment, click to buy, Facebook takes a cut, and it's sent to you very quickly and easily, like almost like with one click in some cases, depending on who the retailer is. That's an incredibly efficient, very inspirational way to shop a lot of brands. And so if you're not going to have that tool in your toolkit, it's going to be very hard for you to hit the market you want to hit. And that's how people are going to start to shop. The, the best way I like to think about it is like, there's 4 million people born every year. Those 4 million people have no idea what a shopping mall used to be or how we used to conceive of retail. All they're going to know is how Instagram is designed the day they first used it. And that's what all of these 4 million births that are happening each and every year are about to see in social media. And that's why it's going to become the new mall from the couch and they're never going to know any better. And so if it's not part of your strategy, you're really probably going to miss out in the long run. Now that makes Facebook tremendously powerful, but Hey, so were malls back in the day. It's just a different way of thinking about it. Making us all feel uh, feel old on this podcast. I never <laughs> right? thought about uh, someone born today is, is only going to know Instagram and Twitter and, and the craziness that is today, and, and they're not going to know what came before them. So that's kind of a scary thought, uh, given how fast things are moving. Um, but I think we could go on and on for, for hours with you, and, and I encourage our audience to, to check out all the, the great content that you put out on, on Forbes. Um, but we want to thank you so much for your time today, Chris. It's great to have you on. It's great to pick your brain. Um, and I'd just like to conclude by telling the audience what's next for you um, and how they can keep up with you. Yeah, I mean, the best way to keep up with us is all of all of our work, all of our content, our podcasts, our writing, everything is on is available on our blog, OmniTalk. That's OmniTalk.blog. Um, and then we also, you know, one of the things when we first got into this business is we thought there was a great white space to, as a real retailer, to tell things like it is, to be candid. Um, but also to stay fresh and to eat what we cook in terms of retail. So my partner, Ann, and I have actually just started a new venture called UrbanRoosterShop.com, which is basically an online marketplace for local brands. It's starting in Minneapolis. We're taking it out to more Midwestern states here soon. Uh, and the idea is to continue to understand everything that we just talked about on this podcast, to live it and breathe it so that the content we put out there each and every day is as valuable as it can be for those that want to consume it. You have a, a lot going on. So uh, again, special thank you for uh, taking the time to come on our podcast and to our audience, you know, follow Chris on LinkedIn, check out uh, omnitalk.blog, check out Urban Rooster Shop, uh, and be sure to check out the Forbes byline as well for his name. He's constantly putting out new content out there and it's, it's really worth the read. Thanks for having me. That's it for this episode of the customer-centric retailing podcast featuring our special guest, Chris Walton. After a 20-year career in the retail trenches, Chris is well-versed in virtually every discipline ranging from retail technology to store operations, e-commerce, and more. 
He strongly believes Omnichannel is the only way forward for retailers, and that in order to actually achieve Omnichannel, you have to do a lot more than just talk about it. There are technological, operational, organizational, and personnel changes that need to happen. If you like what you heard, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts. Please rate and review and recommend to a friend or fellow retail fanatic. This podcast is brought to you by Hot Wax Commerce.